for the bow drill. This is my primary primitive backup to all of my modern ignition sources. The reason being is because with the bow, it gives you a mechanical advantage. If you have moisture, if you have dampness, if you have humidity, you can overcome that because physically you have an advantage. Mechanically, you have an advantage by using the bow. The rule of thumb is, is that if you can take your thumbnail and press it into the wood and it leaves an indentation, then you know that wood's said to be good to try. Uh, doesn't mean it's good to go. There's a lot of woods that won't work uh, well, especially not for a beginner um, that you can actually dent with your thumbnail. So uh, anyway, here we've got uh, willow, we've got uh, tulip poplar, we've got cedar, and that's really the, the kind of the, the beginner bow drill woods that we have around here in the southeast. Uh, we, some places have cottonwood, some places have basswood. You get up into the Smoky Mountains and you start getting some more choices. Uh, but you know, out west you've got your cottonwoods. Up in the Midwest you've got tulip poplars, extremely popular up there. Uh, pop, poplar is popular up there. And uh, up in the Northeast we have aspen, uh, which is a fantastic wood. Um, if I had to choose, I would choose willow first. Uh, as far as beginners, you know, because they're just an easier set to use. I would choose willow, then follow that with aspen. If I can't get that, then I would probably get a hold of, uh, I'd go with basswood, or sorry, cottonwood, basswood, uh, then probably tulip poplar, then cedar. Uh, cedar's not my favorite choice, but that's what I have here uh, available, and it's not good specimen. I actually harvested this chunk of cedar, and you can see the cedar's got a lot of heartwood. Uh, the heartwood is the dark purple stuff, and generally speaking, that heartwood is uh, is a lot more dense uh, than the sapwood, which is the lighter colored wood on the outside. A lot of sapwood is what you want for your bow drill kit. However, heartwood, sapwood, I want more sapwood, but I don't have it. Um, we'll still be able to make it work. Just look at the components of the bow drill. So, you've got a bow. Normally, I'll go, you know, armpit. To fingertip, armpit to wrist, that's about the size of the bow that I'm looking to get. Doesn't matter if it's straight, doesn't matter if it's bent. I like a stick that is uh, is green, meaning it's not dead, uh, so that it won't snap. Doesn't have a lot of flex to it. Let's, let's talk about how we build this, this bow real quick. So what I like to do is uh, spend a little time, just like I do my tinder bundles, I like to spend a little extra time on my bow. I want this thing to work. Uh, I don't want to be messing with this when I'm trying to focus on getting an ember. You have to stop to tighten your string up all the time, and it's it's really kind of an an awkward knot, you know, to tie on here if you don't make any notches. So what we're going to do is is we're going to carve some notches in here to make it easier, so that when we get going on this, it actually stays put as best we can. So it doesn't have to be perfect, but what I've created is basically a pot hanger notch. That allows the string to rest in there and not come undone. On the other side, what I want to do is carve an elongated saddle notch on the top and on the bottom because what I'm trying to do is reduce the amount of material that I have to bore through here in a second. Got an elongated saddle notch on this side. And then what I'm going to do is flip it over to the other side and I'm going to match that. I've significantly reduced the thickness of that and how far I've got to bore through to make my hole. Okay, so I can use this knife, find the center, and I can start boring a hole. One side and the other. If you have a Swiss Army knife, with an awl on it or a multi-tool, it comes in really handy. See how quick that was? Now I've got a hole through my elongated saddle notch. This is uh, a bowline on this end. That just barely slips over top of that and it sits right in that pot hanger notch. Just like that. Come back to the other side once it's on there. Stretch it out to the other side. I'm gonna go through my hole and my elongated saddle notch. Then I'm gonna come around, and I'm gonna to come towards the inside first to trap that up in the saddle notch. Then when I start making my wraps, I try to keep my wraps in the saddle notch so that they don't 
slip off the end. You know, they're kind of held in place. Then I'm just going to throw a couple of half hitches in here. One and two. All right. Doesn't have to be super tight. The next two parts that I'm going to talk to you about are the hardest to reproduce in the wild. So a lot of times I'll carry things that allow for, uh, for me to not have to do this when I'm out in the wild. So it's, it's kind of a semi-primitive skill at that, at that point. You know, it's easy for me to find a bow. It's e easy for me to find a set. Sometimes it's harder to find a, uh, a bearing block and harder to find the cordage uh, or the material to make cordage. However, it's all doable. You can make everything from the landscape. The second part is, is cordage. Now I've just got about a, I don't know, about a three foot section, maybe a four foot section of paracord here. Uh, and this particular piece I carry in my pocket, doesn't take up much space. And then I'm always prepared for something like this. I can use it for other things as well, but uh, because it's always in my pocket, I've, I've actually soaked this one in beeswax. It gives it a little more grip. Uh, a bearing block is nothing more than, than another piece of wood that you're using to set inside your palm that you drill a divot in that sits on top of the spindle and that's what you bear down with downward pressure. My bearing block needs to be harder than these two uh, because, or at least harder than this, because when this sits up in here, as I'm producing friction, it's wearing away dust from both the end of my spindle and from the hearth board. I don't want that friction up here. I want this to be as friction free as possible. And if this is a softer wood just like this is, then this will wear evenly with this and I'll get friction up here that I don't want early. All right, so what I like to do, and yes, you can do that. I could use the same piece. I could use a cedar bearing block. I just have to do a little more maintenance as I'm producing the ember. Down here in the south, we have fat wood, which has uh, resin, it's a resin uh, resin infused pine basically but what that does is it actually as it heats up that resin turns back to a kind of a liquid state and that actually lubricates this really well so that fat wood you know tends to tends to have less friction when you're using it as a bearing block so anytime I can find that I'm going to use that one thing I have in my fire kit here where I was talking about you know the bearing block and the cordage being the hardest things to find so I carry little little things uh, that I think are useful. So this particular steel striker was made for me uh, and it actually has a small bow drill divot in it. Um, that was made for me by a guy named Patrick Farnham at Valley Forge. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's also my my flint striker. But to make it more useful for me, you know, he added a bow drill divot. So I use that quite a bit. You don't have to have something like that. It's just a nice to have. But today we're going to be using some natural stuff. Natural stuff. And then you've got the fourth component, which is the spindle. One thing that you'll read in the manuals also that's that's incorrect and is a myth is it says that you know you have to have a hardwood spindle with a softwood board. And you read another manual and you have to have a hardwood board and a softwood spindle. When you actually do this, you'll find out that it can be. Uh, mixed and matched or it can be from the same piece. 99% of the bow drill kits that I make are from the same piece of wood. I myself, once I find a piece of wood that's good for either, it's good for both. I'm not going to spend the time going out and finding a different species. I like to have mine be about, you know, thumb to pinky, so probably 8 inches, maybe 10 inches or so. As far as the shape goes, if you look at it as it is now, think back to when you were in kindergarten and you had those big fat pencils, that's kind of what you're going for. You know, kind of the rule of thumb, like a literal rule of thumb that you'll see on the bow drill is a good place to start is thumb thickness. You know, thumb thickness for that, thumb thickness for your hearth board. Then my hearth board is just a, a rectangular board. Uh, I try to go about four fingers wide so that I can use both sides. And I try to go about thumb thick all the way around, right? And when I'm shaping these, you know, I'm going to hammer this out of, of a full block. And then I'm going to use a uh, kind of an improvised planer. I'm going to use my knife and kind of shape it. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it does have to sit flat. I don't want it to rock. So that's the shape that I'm going for, that rectangular shape. Rule of thumb, about the same length as your spindle because it came from the same piece of wood. 
the one last thing that I want to tell you about that you'll need is a catch pan, an ember catch. So I've got myself a little catch pan. First off, you've got to do a burn in. And to do the burn in, what you want to do is find out, take a look at your board and find out where you want to actually start. Where do I locate this? I don't want to be closer than a thumb to the end because it may split out on me. So at least that far in is where I want to begin. And the same thing for this edge. I don't want to be right on the edge whenever I'm starting to, to actually seat my set and get it seated. I want to go about at least half the distance of that spindle in and at least a thumb away from here. Now, I need to make a divot. So what you can do is I want my the center to be right there, the center of my spindle. So what I'm going to do is choke up on the knife and when I mean choke up on the knife, the edge is still away from my fingers. And I'm not using any part of my body as a backstop. I poke the knife in there. And I just kind of score around lightly. In a circle. And choking up on the knife allows me to have better control. It doesn't have to be all that deep. I've got this hearth board pretty thick, you know, to give me some time. To show you how to pick up on a missed ember if it happens. So I don't have to worry too much about going too deep. If you've got a thin board, you'll burn through it pretty quickly. Especially if you make this initial divot a little too aggressive. You know, you're cutting away material that you don't have to produce friction later. But this one's plenty thick enough. And all I'm doing is giving the, this drill a place to start. So, loading the bow. Obviously keep it in mind which end is forward. To load the bow, what I like to do is, you want the bow to end up with obviously the eraser side down. And it has to be, you know, the line has to be wrapped around it. You also want to make sure that the spindle is on the outside of the string. What that does for you is allow you to use the full length of the bow. If it's on the inside of the string when you end up being finished, then you're actually going to lose a good three to four inches of your bow on both sides and you're not going to be as efficient as you would if this is on the outside where you can use the entire length of the bow. So to load it, all you have to do is with this facing, sorry, this facing up come towards the inside because once I flip this I want it to end up on the outside. Then you just wrap this around until you hear it snap. Then what I like to do is pin it to the side of the bow with my thumb just like that. Now body position. I try to keep my board at a 90 at a, basically parallel. Keep my shoulders parallel to my hearth board and my foot at a 90 degree perpendicular. I get this in a spot where it sits nice and flat, which I don't really have going on right here, but I think we'll be okay. I want to set my foot as close as I can to that hole. What that allows me to do is when I lock my wrist on my shin bone, I'm directly up and down with the spindle. If I'm out too far, I have to reach over to have my spindle up and down and this is less stable. I want to be able to lock my wrist in and have that go straight up and down. So what I'm going to do is get my foot as close as possible. I'm going to turn a little bit so that you can see everything. I'm going to get my foot as close to, as possible to that edge so that when I lock my wrist in place the spindle is straight up and down. Now it's very important on this bearing block that I also keep this bearing block parallel, not so much this way, but parallel as far as this face with this face to the ground. Because if I turn any way, shape or form, it's going to create shoulder friction up here. I want all the friction down here. I don't want the friction up here. So the first step that I'm going to do is I'm going to burn in. It's called burning in. Basically, I'm marrying this bottom edge to the actual surface of the hearth board, that divot I made, as well as up here in my bearing block. And when I'm doing this, when I'm bowing, 
I got to start getting this thing to start marrying up. So I'm going to take little short strokes just to get things going. And one of the keys that I want to talk to you about is the mechanical advantage of the bow drill depends on you actually using the bow in the most efficient manner. So if I'm short stroking this, I'm less efficient. If I'm using the full length of the bow, I'm just maximizing the efficiency of this type of a system. The other key thing is I want to keep the bow parallel with the ground. Because if I let this bow tip go up, you can watch the string start to climb up on the actual spindle and it'll fly out. If I let the bow tip down, it'll start climbing down and eventually it'll go out all the way down to the bottom and lock out. So I need to make sure, move it up to the center again, I need to make sure that I keep that parallel. Now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to do about you know 10 to 15 strokes to get that set warmed up. Notice how my armpit is locked onto my knee, my bicep is touching my knee, I've got my forearm touching my shin, and I've got my wrist locked into my shin as well. All of those points of contact make this much more stable. This leg is out of the way. What I need to be able to do is put downward pressure on this as I'm increasing in speed here, as I'm actually bowing. It's a combination and a balance between uh, the actual speed of the bow and downward pressure. One has to kind of play off of the other and we'll talk about that a little bit. If, you know, uh, for some reason you're not strong enough to put enough downward pressure, what you can do is take this leg and drive it back in a lunge. And what that does is it brings my chest down and in turn drives that force to give me more downward pressure. First 10 or 15 strokes or so do nothing but warm up the set. And you'll feel it start to change. You'll start to get little whiffs of smoke and then you can just gradually increase your speed and downward pressure. And what I'm watching for down here is I'm watching for my dust to start spinning and everything to marry up nicely and start running smooth. Uh, and you'll actually be able to hear it. So right now I'm not putting a lot of effort in it. You should still be able to have a conversation while you're doing this. Because I'm not going for fire yet, I'm just going for a burn in. But this also tells me whether or not this set is going to be good. It's starting to change now. When you hear squeaks like that, it means you don't have enough downward pressure or you're starting to shoulder out in your bearing block up top here. So the key to that is increase the downward pressure until you get that squeak out. If it's because of your bearing block, we'll fix that in a second. Now I've effectively burned in and I've also, if you notice, the top of this is smoking. And I've also really worked out that divot up there. So the squeaking that you're hearing is likely up top here where I have shoulder friction and I don't want that. But what I'm trying to accomplish is a burn in right now. So that part is done and I can fix this before I go back to starting. My divot is now burnt in. And I'm going to use that as a gauge to carve my actual notch. So the first thing I've got to do is actually take a little bit of time and score that notch. And that notch 
like I said, is going to go about, you know, maybe 20%, maybe 30% into scored those lines. And what I'm going to do is take those lines because I've got a triangle this way. I also want a triangle this way because that allows maximum airflow and that pyramid type structure will help my dust stay together in a nice pile. So I'm going to take those. I've got those lines there. I'm going to transfer those down to this other edge. I've got Now I'm just going to carve those out using my knife. Burned in, got my notch carved out. Now as I'm carving my notch, I've lost all the heat that I've generated before. Uh, so essentially I'm starting over, but now I have a notch that I'm going to fill with fuel. Because I'm going to go from this step to actually filling the notch with fuel and then actually lighting the notch after that without stopping, I need to make sure that my set is in complete working order as if I'm starting from scratch so that I don't have to stop midway because you know my bearing block or whatever I've got too much shoulder friction or my string gets loose or something to that effect. So I'm going to set myself up for success by taking care of that stuff again before I get back into this. A couple things that I'm going to do to dress this up, to kind of touch this up before I get going again, is I don't want this so deep because that allows the shoulder to touch. What I can do is take just kind of like a, a small sliver of that and I can cut that off. Now what I've done is reduced it back down to that small little hole and I've actually got some, some fire hardening going on there. And then, you know, that takes care of all of that. So on the end, this is no longer a point. This is kind of blended off. So I'm going to take the time before I get going. And you can tell how sweaty I am. It's hot out here. And I'm going to take the time to resharpen this so that when I get going again, I have the maximum amount of time before it starts shouldering out again and producing friction up top where I don't want it. Keeping in mind that the very tip of this has also been blackened from the heat, which makes it stronger. So I'm trying to preserve that blackened tip. As best as I can. Now when it sits in there, you know, I've got the maximum amount of time before these shoulders get up into the bearing block and start causing me problems. Looking at the bottom, the bottom of it's also hardened. I want that to not be hardened when I start back up because I'm trying to produce dust from that bottom and if it's hardened and glossed over it'll slide rather than produce friction and actually grind the material off the dust that I want. I'll go ahead and tighten that before I get started again just because it's a good habit to get into. I want everything to be right before I go again because I'm going to go from filling this notch to lighting it. And I don't want to stop because every time I stop, it reduces the heat that I've already generated. And it'll take me more effort to get that heat generated again. My string is tightened up. My spindle is dressed up. My bearing block is touched up. I've got my notch carved in. I'm burned in. Now I'm going to place my catch pan underneath the notch so that the dust that's collected will build up on there. I'm getting myself set back up in my position. Locking everything in. Then I'm going to get everything running smoothly again. Use the full length of your bow. Keep the bow parallel to the ground. And I'm watching for dust to start spilling into that notch, which it's doing now. And right now, you know, I'm not going crazy. I've got a little bit, there we go. I'm gonna get a little more downward pressure on that to get that squeak out. Once I start generating dust, I'm just gonna keep that pace nice and slow until that notch gets reasonably full. 
I'm going to get some smoke, but I'm not worried about that because I'm not ready to light that yet. Looking at the color of my dust. Good dark chocolate color. At this point I've got quite a bit of smoke, but I don't have a full notch yet. But it is nice and clumpy and nice and dark. So I'm just going to build up some of that. Now looking at this, I can tell with this dust building up around the outside rather than in the notch, that that tells me that my notch is a little bit too shallow. So what I want to do is move that good dust, you can tell how clumpy that is, down onto my catch pan because essentially that's that's fuel, that's firewood, you know, if you think of it that way. But I want to make this notch a little bit deeper before I really get too far into this. And these are some of the things that you gain more experience that you'll start to notice and not waste a lot of effort when you can make a little adjustment and it'll make all the difference. So it's just a little too shallow so I need to take that V a little deeper without making it wider I just need to go a little deeper so that that dust falls more freely into the notch. All right took that a little bit deeper. I'm going to set that right back down where it was because that dust that I've already created is good dust and all I'm doing right now is generating dust to fill that notch, so I'm going to use that to my advantage. Since I stopped, I'm going to take advantage of the opportunity to reduce that friction up top again before I get going. So the key takeaway from this is every time you stop, you're losing heat, but I'm doing this in stages. And right now, I want to reduce, take this opportunity to reduce this friction up top so that I don't have to do it when it actually matters, when I'm actually trying to go for it here. And the cues that I'm looking for when I get going again is one, I've got to build up the heat once again. Two is everything has to start running smoothly. That's kind of my second cue is when it kind of the sound changes and I can feel it go from kind of choppy to running really smooth. That's my second cue. My third cue will be that I start to get a little bit of smoke. That cues me in that I can increase the speed and uh, possibly increase the pressure. Each one of these cues is going to let me know that I can do that. Uh, so once I get everything kind of running smoothly again and the sound changes, then I can, know I can increase the speed a little bit and the downward pressure gradually. Uh, I'll get a little bit of smoke. That tells me it's ready for the next step, which means I can give it a little more speed and a little more downward pressure. Then I'll start getting a lot of smoke. Um, before I get to that, I'm going to be watching the front side of my notch here and make sure that it's full. It doesn't do me any good to go all out and try to light this if I don't have any fuel in here. It's essentially like you're trying to uh, establish a small little fire lay right down here in the, in the, uh, in the notch. Um, so, probably once I get up to that step to where I'm getting a little bit of smoke and it's running smoothly, I'm going to continue to bow until that notch is full. Once that notch is full, then I can start looking for the next cue and I can give it a little more speed and downward pressure. I'm going to get a lot of smoke at that point. And from that point on, I'm going to gradually increase the speed and pressure until I see the smoke pouring out of the front side of the dust that's coming out of the notch. And then I'm going to stop nice and slow, take my time, and ease my foot off. So I'm telling you that now because once I get going on this, you know, it might not be as evident.
carefully lift your foot off. I can see the smoke's rolling out the front. I want to get that off there so I can get some air to it. Then what you can do, because there's so much heat built up in here, and I'm constantly losing heat, I can lift that up and set that right up on top of there. Now's the time to catch your breath. Oh, battery's going dead. Let's see. There you can see. I've got a pile there that'll last 10 to 12 minutes of smoldering at this rate. And what I'm trying to do is let that fuse into a coal. And I want that coal to be roughly the size of my, my pinky nail, maybe even my thumbnail before I transfer that over. So you got time to catch your breath now, get everything prepped. Let me get this out of the way. Now, the wind is blowing this way, and I want to use that to my advantage. I'm going to bring my tender bundle to here. Get all this out of the way. Now, just so you can see how much time I've got, it's about the size it needs to be to transfer it over. And this is one of the reasons, because that fine dust is what this is actually using as fuel right now. It's one of the reasons we make the inside of our tinder bundle such, an, a, uh, such a super fine mesh so that when I transfer this over it doesn't just fall through the tinder bundle. Once it's big enough and I've caught my breath, I know the wind is going this way so I'm going to use that to my advantage. I'm going to pick that coal up. I'm going to actually marry those two together I'm going to let that sit again for a second because I want that coal to start fusing again. No reason to get in a hurry yet. Now, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to try to get this over here. I want to gently fold this kind of in a taco because I want my superfine tender to be in contact with that coal, but I don't want to crush it. I'm going to kind of fold it a little bit. And then I'm going to hold it up and have this open in the back. And I'm going to give it long, slow breaths. And once I start getting smoke to go through the back side, I know I can blow a little bit harder. And once it burns, I know the fire likes to climb, I'm just going to start turning it on its side so that it can catch the rest of that tinder bundle. Woo! Now I've got all my little shavings I can toss on there. And it won't be long before I'm headed towards a nice sustainable fire.